last week we started our, our what we call HF Cubed series, um, HF Cubed, and I, I said that these three words that we'll be talking about over the next few weeks will become an umbrella to this house, an umbrella of who we are as a church, um, what we will do, what we will go after, and how we will operate, because we believe that God has called us uh, to, reach, to reach a harvest. We believe that there's people that still need to hear the gospel message, amen. amen. We still believe that there's people that still need to be discipled, amen. amen. We still believe that there's hurting people that need restoration and healing in their body, and we believe that Jesus is the answer, and he chooses to use the local church to do so. Amen. That was how he instituted this thing to begin with. That's what the book of Acts is all about. It's all about when Jesus said in, in Matthew that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Luke begins to write in the book of Acts about the fulfillment of those words. Those that heard those words, how they took them to heart and they win. They, begin to, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. They begin to preach. They begin to spread. They they. they they begin to separate, and they begin to go about the land. And because they had enough faith to do so, we today are still the church. The church is not dead. The church is very much alive. And I believe that Jesus is the hope for humanity. And the church is the hope for the, for, for the regions and the areas because we offer Jesus. Amen. Hopefully that's why you come to church. You come to church so that you can be discipled, but also encouraged and empowered. I believe that this is like our, our, our fuel stop for the week. You know, this is where we, where we come, and I, 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 have, I have some great friends in ministry that have great television ministry programs. Um, actually, Heritage Fellowship is on, is, is on TV once a week with our, with our, on a local channel here where we broadcast our, our services. I don't have any problem with people watching pe ministers preach on TV. They receive the word all the time. But a television can never replace a local body. A television can never replace a local body. Actually, I was listening to um, a, a, a pastor in Knoxville just, just the other day, and he was talking about this very thing, and I, and I loved it, and um, I was shouting at the TV, but he couldn't hear me because I was just agreeing with him. And he was talking about letters that he receives after people watch his, his television program. And, and he, he said he just started responding to people and told them, quit holding me to an expectation that I can't live up to. Because what you need is a pastor. I'm just here to encourage you in the word, but I can't pastor you. You need to find you a local church, you need to find you a pastor, and you need to surround yourself with people of faith because that's really what you need. You don't need another word from TV. And I had great appreciation for that because I believe the same thing. It's an avenue to share the gospel, but nothing can replace the local body. Nothing can replace the community of faith that fills this room. Nothing can, can replace when somebody knows your name and wants to actually do life with you to help encourage you in the journey. I think one of the, the dangers of, of, of a new believer is when they can't connect with a church. And I just promised you I'd be transparent in this series, as I, as I am always. So we're going to talk about that this morning and what the Lord's laid on my heart and the importance of us being a church that does connect. Uh, behind me, you see in these three boxes on the stage um, some, math, some mathematical equations or formulas, concepts, all different ones, and all of them will help you arrive to a desired outcome. All of these equations and formulas and concepts that you see on these little chalkboards and the outside boxes here, all of them will help you arrive to a desired outcome. The formula in the middle is the one we came up with to help describe because we believe that there are variables here in this house that will work together to give us our desired outcome. And they are experience, connection, and serving. Experience, connecting, and serving. Um, HF cubed, what it says is this, that Heritage Fellowship is experience. Heritage Fellowship is connection. And Heritage Fellowship 
is service. Everybody say is. is. Heritage Fellowship is connection. Heritage Fellowship is experience. Heritage Fellowship is service. That word is is very powerful. There comes, all of us pray about things. But there comes a time you got to be confident in the is. You got to be confident in the mission that God's placed before you. You have to be confident in what is the thing that God has asked you to do. And we just believe that as a church, in our pursuit to love God, to love others, to share that by serving together, that Heritage Fellowship is a place where people can experience. We talked about experience last, last week. Everybody say experience. We spoke about experience last week, and I said my desire is that Heritage Fellowship will be a place where people can always experience the love of God. Because I believe that when people experience John 3.16 in its fullest, when they experience that, God, that there's a God that loved them so much that he was willing to send the very best that he had, the only that he had, his only begotten son, for them, that's a love like no other. That is a love that supersedes any, any love that really we could ever give. He didn't give the middle child. He didn't give just the youngest or the oldest. He gave it all, his only. Everybody say only. And I believe that when somebody experiences that love, that love of a father, we talked about the Lord's prayer not too long ago, coming into the beginning of the year, our Father which are in heaven, giving him that rightful place. Abba, Father, that he will be called Abba, Father, Daddy. He'd be the one. And that that Father loved us so much that he gave his very best. He gave his only son. And I believe that when people experience that love, then they can experience the resurrection of the Son. They can receive the power of the Holy Spirit. But they... It all starts when they experience the love of the Father that loved them in spite of their imperfections. That loved them when we were yet sinners, he still died for us. When we were sinners, he died for us. That's love. That is love. What greater love can one give than the one that would lay down their life for you? Love. So we talked about experience last week, and today we're going to talk about this word connect. Everybody say connect. Connect means to join, link, or fasten together. To join, link, or fasten together. That's what connect means. To join, link, or fasten together. That's the reason I, I took time this morning to talk about church membership, because church membership is just a way to connect with the body. Because church membership isn't about holding a special key to a special club that nobody else can get into. Church membership is about partnering together, joining together, linking together, fastening together, making a commitment. The problem in so many lives today is we don't want to commit to anything. We treat marriage like a, you know, that's just like going to lease a car. We'll try this one out for three years. We don't like it. We'll trade in on a newer model. We treat every, we have this, this fear of connecting. Oftentimes, fear of connecting is because of hurts of our past. We're afraid to latch on to anybody else or anything else because the last one destroyed us. We're afraid to connect with a church. Because we read on MSNBC one time that one church did something wrong, and so now all churches are bad. We're, we're, we, we, we don't trust anybody. We're not going to connect to anything. And then we wonder why we walk through life so lonely. As, as, a, as, as, as a pastor, um, every time I, I, I do a funeral... And it's at a funeral home. And the, the funeral directors will always say, hey, pastor, would you be interested in um, being on call for us if we ever have a funeral that somebody doesn't have a pastor? And I think, that's the reality. That's the reality. 
That's the reality. Because people have a, a fear of connecting. Listen, if you, you might have been hurt in your past. I've been hurt. If I allowed my hurts to stop me, you would have never met me. But all of us in this room have experienced hurt at some time. All of us have experienced betrayal. All of us have a reason to not be here today. All of us have a legitimate excuse of why we should not be sitting here today and why we shouldn't trust again. But I'm reminded that because of Jesus, old things are passed away and everything is made new. Either we believe the word of God or we don't. I'm thankful for redemption. I'm thankful that he heals and he takes the place from my sins. I'm thankful that he washes my sins as far as the east is from the west. But I'm also thankful that when I am a believer and I am saved and I am in a relationship with him, I'm thankful that when hell breaks loose that he still shows up with redemption power. I'm thankful that my relationship with him goes past my salvation experience. I'm thankful that he's my savior, but I'm also thankful that he's the Lord of my life, that he's the friend that sticks closer than any brother. I'm thankful that it's not just about a one time, a one and done, but it's about a daily experience with him that our relationship grows and I can love him more today than I did yesterday. I'll love him more tomorrow than I did today because he never ceases. He never grows weary. He never tires. He never quits it's working. He is always on the move. He's an ever increasing God. He's amazing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he's constantly new in my life. He's constantly new in my life. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that this morning. Teddy Roosevelt once said, and I have to agree with him in this statement, that the single most important ingredient to success is knowing how to get along with people. He was asked one time, what would you say the, the number one key is in your success? He says, knowing how to get along with people. Let, let me help you understand something. People play an important role in your life. Jesus showed us that. When God created man, then he knew that that man needed some serious help, so he created a woman. And I'm thankful for that. Any brothers in the house say amen? amen. My wife could probably do fine without me, but I cannot do well without her. My children would even say amen. But th throughout the word of God, we see where where God in connecting with his people always connected them with people. Jesus showed us that way when he surrounds himself with 12. He found so much value in that 12 that when he went away and he began to, to pray and he came back and they were all sleeping that he said, can you not hang with me for an hour? Can, can you not tarry with me for an hour? Can you not stick with me? He valued those people in our lives. We must value people in our lives. The thing is, in order to value something, we have to understand the value of it. If we don't see the value of people in our lives, then we will never value people in our lives. Some of you are in sales. That's your motivation every day is to take your product and con convince somebody of the value of it and how it will bring value to their life so that they pay the value you said it's worth. What's a deal? When somebody presents something to me and I decide if I want to pay as much as they tell me the value of it is. A deal to you may not be a deal to me. It's all about the amount of worth that I find in it. Some of you would say, there was, I would never pay a penny for a motorcycle. I would pay a lot of pennies for motorcycles. Because, they're, they're, because I like it. It's more valuable to me than it is for, for you. We all have our thing. If we don't understand the value of people in our life, we will never value the people in our life. The thing about connecting is, and connecting with people, is people require what is most important to us, besides God, and it's our time. Everybody say time. Oh, I know we say all the time, time is money, but some of you 
would pay people to leave you because they're an inconvenience to you. I met a guy one time, and uh, he was talking about when he started his, his speaking business, and he told this story, and I won't bore you with the details, but he was putting on his first conference, and he rented a hotel um, facility to do it, and he had 100 seats, and he had built up his clientele base, and so he sent out tickets to come hear him speak for $99 a seat, and within a day and a half, he sold all 100 seats. He was so excited. This is a true story. This isn't a joke. Some of you look at me like, where's the punchline? Where's the joke? This isn't a joke. This really happened. And he said he was so excited, so for two months he prepared. He gets there. He gets set up. He's got 100 seats in the room. He had sold out in a day and a half, so he knew that the tickets were out there. And when it was time to start, there was one person in the room. And he said, I learned a very valuable lesson. People are more willing to give me money to appease me but they will only give me their time if I can bring value into their life. Time. Time is so valuable to us. And people require that. People require that. People require that amount of time. So when we look in the book of Acts, we see, and I alluded to this just a few moments ago, when we, when we get to the book of Acts, we see where Luke, he, he writes this book to talk about the fulfillment of what Jesus had declared in Jesus' words when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And as I looked, searched the word of God and, and, and read through it on different scriptures of connecting, I just kept going back to Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to use one verse out of there, and it's probably not the one you're thinking of this morning, but I'm going to use one little verse out of there, and we're going to talk about that verse this, this morning, and it is this, Acts chapter 2, verse 44, and it says this, now, somebody say now. now, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Everybody say all. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. If you read all the supporting scriptures around Acts chapter 2, verse 44, you see where those that Jesus stood before and, and, and declared that they would go and they would do greater works than, than even he had done, they actually believed him and they went after it. And now all of a sudden, those that are building the church, and Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We find that they went out, they begin to build the New Testament church, and it says, now all that believed were together. Everybody say that word together. Together actually comes from a Greek phrase meaning toward the same thing, or it also means in the same place. What it does is it conveys the idea of united purpose. That word together there conveys the idea that they were united in purpose. They were joined together. They were connected. Everybody say connected. And you find that through their connection, the church was added to daily. The church was added to daily. We, f we find that because they were connected and they did life together, there, there, there's a lot being said in this little verse. They had all things in common. They would, they would sell things to help out a brother. If somebody was in need, they would sell their possessions. They'd bring it all together to help that person that was in need. They did life together. The great thing was, as I was studying for this, I saw a lot of the heartbeat of heritage already taking place in these passages of Scripture. I mean, that, that, that's, heritage, that's Heritage Fellowship. Heritage Fellowship is, is the ones that'll put together an event to sow into a baby's life that's not even born yet and raise $6,000 to meet a need of a family. Heritage Fellowship is, 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 is one that when the pastor feels led to sow into another pastor, receives a spontaneous offering, and you give five, over $500 to just be a blessing to another ministry. Uh, spontaneously. That's what the New Testament church did. When they found somebody was in need, they would gather as many resources as they could, and they wanted to meet the need. They did life together. Everybody say life. They did life together. We talk a lot here at Heritage about you know, our family culture and our guest culture. And, and as we're, we're, we're strategically building teams for people to serve on and stuff, I'm just reminded of that. Listen, church should always be a family that you belong to, not just someplace you go to. Yeah, 
church should be a family you belong to, not just a place you attend. But church should be a family that you belong to. And that's important for us to realize. But in the attempt of being a family, we can never exclude others from coming and being a part of the family. Now, I'm blessed. I hope others can feel the same way about your life. But my in-laws love me, or at least they act like it. I get a Christmas present every year. But, but literally, I mean, really, my, 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 my mother and father-in-law, I mean, they, they treat me like their own. If, if, if they do something for Nicole, they do something for me. They, they, they look at us together. My family does the same thing with Nicole. It's not, you know, you're just along for the ride because you're with my son or you're with my daughter, but you're a part of our family. They extended their family. Actually, in our engagement video, we, we recorded when I proposed to Nicole, and I had a lot of family and friends there. And as soon as I asked her if she would marry me, and she said, yes, you hear in the background, my father-in-law says, I finally got a boy. Because he's had four girls in the house for so long. And he says, we couldn't even buy a male dog. Even our two dogs were females. <laughs> it's in the background of our engagement video. I finally got a boy. Why? Why? Because I was no longer an, an outsider. But I was part of the family. The New Testament church, they were a family. All who believe were together. They were connected. They had all things in common. They did life together. But read the very last verse of Acts chapter 2. It says, and daily the church was added to. In the attempt of having the family unit, they were always open to receiving somebody else into the family. As a church... As we have a family culture, we always have to be willing to allow the in-laws to show up. And not make them outlaws, but make them part of the family. So there's three ways that, that, that we do that. I want to talk about them very quickly this morning. When we value, the value of connecting is this. The value of connecting is, the first one is relationships. Everybody say Relationships. Relationships means a connection, association, or involvement. A connection is, a relationship is a connection, association, or involvement. To be involved with, to be connected to, that's what a relationship is. We, we have to realize that our relationships of our life play a place in our life, but our relationships, they either pull us back or they push us forward. Some of our spiritual roller coasters that we're on all has to do with the people we're connected to. Because we come into the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning, we sit at the end of the pew, and we worship together and we feel good, but we have no relationships in the body. We're not really a part of the family. We just show up to this event. And when we show up to the event, we don't connect we connect with God, but we miss the other important part of the equation. And we leave and we go back to the ones that pull us back instead of the ones that push us forward. Relationships either push you forward or pull you back. Actually, what you'll find is relationships, they, they'll either add to your life or they will subtract from your life. Relationships will either add to your life or they'll subtract from your life. Now let me hit pause there for a minute. Because subtraction's not always bad. Because a healthy relationship is a give or take. I actually was speaking to a, a young man this week. And talking about relationships. And, and, and I, I told him this. I said, if you're going to be selfish, now's the time to be selfish while you're single. Because when you say I do, there's give and take. Any of the married people say amen? amen? It's a give and take. It's a give and take. Yes, my wife subtracts from my life at times, but I willingly give that to her. I've got to be able to invest into her life. 
I have to be able to give to her. That's the reason I have to make sure I keep filling myself. Because I can't be the man that she needs in her life if I'm not the man he needs me to be. I subtract from her life. She says, Amen. But it's a give and take. So subtraction is not always bad. You just got to make sure you're keeping something in the tank for somebody to pull from. Because we should all be investing into each other's lives. There's many of you in this room that invest into my life constantly. Words, prayers, things of encouragement. You invest into my life. But I can tell that it comes from you allowing him to pour into you. So people either add to your life, they subtract from your life. Some people will multiply your life. That's the kind of people I really like to be around. Add to me or multiply what's taking place. What you have to be careful for are the people that divide your life. Division. Division. You got to be careful because people will divide. The kingdom operates through relationships. I believe that that relationships is a currency of the kingdom. It's what causes the kingdom of God to go forth. That's what we talked about for 40 minutes last week. That's what we talked about. We talked about John 3, 16, that God loved us so much that he gave his only son. My question to you is, what do relationships look like in your life? What do your church relationships look like in your life? And what I'm making a statement this morning about is this, that Heritage Fellowship will be a place that you can connect with the people of God. Not only can you connect with him, but you can also connect with his people. And and you may have been here a long time, but we're, we are striving and we are working and we will be a place that new people can connect. Amen. Because if not, then we're going to be a dead church instead of a thriving church. This afternoon, before we go to the next point, hit the perfect example. If you're a senior adult, you're new to heritage. Don't worry if you didn't bring anything for the luncheon. I was down there early and there's plenty and it's good. If you're a senior adult, you're welcome to connect. It's a great place to connect. And you will love the banana pudding. But it's connect. It's an opportunity to connect. It's an opportunity to build relationships. Everybody say relationships. Also part of connecting that we will constantly strive to improve in our church is discipleship, discipleship. Discipleship is to teach or to train. In other words, it's to add value to somebody's life. I'm a firm believer that what you make happen for somebody else, God will make happen for you. Discipleship is about teaching and training. Yes, it comes from the word disciple, to be a Christ follower. But discipleship is about teaching and training. We want to be good stewards of the gifts that are in this house. I sat with, um, with a couple this week that is work and, and, and some staff in a creative planning meeting about our our Easter experience and uh, Palm Sunday we're going to do an illustrated sermon why because the gift is in the house and I want to be a good steward of the gift now if they weren't good at drama they wouldn't have been invited to the meeting so there's there's gifts it's it's to, it's to add value to disciple is to add value I love it when Paul said in first Corinthians 11 1 he said imitate me as I imitate Christ He said, follow me as I follow Christ. What he was saying is, let me refine you. Let me impart into you. Let me add value to your life. Let me help you. But don't just follow me because Paul knew he had weaknesses like everybody else. But Paul said, follow my example as I follow Christ. A, a, A connecting church is one that disciples people to say, we will show you the way of how to be a Christ follower. Now, we have work to do in this area, and I'll be honest. But we will strive for that perfection because that's how the church grows. When they come and they experience God, we have to be able to connect them, not only relationally, but through discipleship. Teach and to train, not just Sunday morning goosebumps, but Monday through Saturday living, working out the crooked places of life. Seeing old things become new. Amen? If you've been serving the Lord a long time, are you thankful that somebody discipled you? Are you thankful that somebody found the, the importance to, to add value to you? I love, 
2 Timothy um, chapter 1, and I won't read all of it, but Paul starts out and talking to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you. He says, I thank God for you. He talks about how he misses Timothy and how he looks forward to the time that they'll be together again. And, 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 and he, he talks about how he prayed for Timothy day and night. He constantly poured into And he tells, tells Timothy that I remember your faith. I remember the faith of your grandmother. I remember the faith of your mother. And now I see the same faith continue strong into you. What was Paul doing? Paul was discipling Timothy and he was encouraging him. And, he, and then he reminds him, he says, Timothy, for God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We all need to have the Timothy in our life. We all need a Paul in our life, and we all need a Timothy in our life. Paul was saying, I can't be with you right now, but I made a commitment into your life, and I'm writing to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. I long for the day we'll be together again. But until that day comes, remember, Timothy, don't give in to the spirit of fear and timidity, but it's through the power of love and self-discipline. Paul said, we can't be there. I can't be there physically, but I can be there to be your encourager. Who are you adding value to in your life? And the last point is this, partnership. Everybody say partnership. The value of connecting is this. It's relationships, it's discipleship, and it's partnership. I love the word partnership, and I define it this way. Partnership is to share in the action. Partnership is to share in the action. Hey, we want you to join Heritage Fellowship. But greater than being another name on our role, greater than saying we got 30 more members, is for you to share in the action with us, to link arms with us, to connect. I love reading the word of God when I see partnership like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want some Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednego in my life. I want some people around me that when I'm thrown into the furnace of life, that they'll stand with me. I love, the thing I love about reading the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says that when they were thrown in that furnace, they began to move about. They began to walk around. They began to move about the flames. They didn't lay there. Uh, they, they weren't, I wasn't there, but the way I read the scriptures was they began to move together. They stayed together. They said, we said we'd go in this thing together, and we're going to move through these flames together. When you're connected as we're as a connected house and partnership together means that when the flames of hell heat up in your life, we're going to walk through them with you. When you're celebrating on the mountaintop, we'll walk through them with you. This is not a, this is not a, we'll make the decision that day whether we're going to go to battle with you or not. There is something that develops. Some of you have past military experience and I love setting and hearing stories of relationships that was built in a trench. Relationships that were built in a trench. When gunfire was all around and the enemy was encroaching, they'll say, but my brother had my back. While we were fighting the enemy, you kept fighting. When I ran out of ammo, you covered me while I reloaded. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, oh, they worshiped together, but they went in the flames together. Ladies and gentlemen, that's partnership. That's partnership. We're not going to say, hey, we'll send you an AC unit. We'll say, we'll walk through the flames with you. And when you're down, we'll pick you up. We'll stand together. We'll, we'll rejoice together. We'll worship together. Stand with me all across this house. The value of connecting is relationships. It's discipleship. It's partnership. Everybody say partnership. It's to share in the action together. Decision begins the connecting process. Decision begins the connecting process. You have a choice. Now I know some of us like being around people more than others. I get it. But it doesn't change the fact that you need people in your life. You may not need as many as I do, because I'm more the merrier. I like the party. I like the noise. I like the chaos of it. I like the party. You may not need as many as I do, but you need somebody. You need somebody. 
And one, of, and, and one of the things that I'm passionate about as your pastor is creating a place that people can connect. I love family. I love it. I love it. I love the hugs. I love the encouragement. I love family. But I want us to be that Acts chapter 2. I want us to be the ones that are together in all things. But I also want us to be the one that the church is added to daily. I want us to be, we got a great family, but come on in. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Ah, I know you don't, maybe you look a little rough. Maybe you've walked through some life. We don't care about that. Because you know what a family does? A family, a true family, sticks together in the thick and the thin. A true family, when the enemy tries to divide, they link arms and come together. A true family stays together and figures out a way to work through the differences. Work through the differences. If you're going to be part of the family, you have to learn to trust again. You have to learn to connect again. You have to learn to link up again. If you've been hurt by another church, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But do me a favor and don't hold it against this church. If you've been hurt by somebody else, listen, ask the Lord to give you the ability to trust again. You have every reason to not do what you do, but you trust it again. You have faith again. You linked up again. And all things were passed away and everything was made new. Tom, you have every reason to not link up again. We've talked about life, but you trust it again. And old things are passed away and everything's made new. I could go through this house. A church, of drive, a church alive is worth the drive. That's what Damien says. Listen, I know we all have past. I'm just going to say it. We've all been through hell. But it doesn't change the reality of heaven. And there's a God that loves you. There's a God that loves you. You can decide this morning, I'm going to connect with him and I'm going to connect with others so that I can be all that he's declared I'll be. Listen. Don't hold it against everybody else. Allow the Spirit of the Lord to break that yoke in your life, bring healing in your life so that you can sing again, so that you can rejoice again, so that you can be everything that God desires for you to be.